Okay, today's topic is milk for making cheese. And we are going to be looking at the production of this milk, how it's stored and transported to get to the cheese house in order to make the cheese, what the effects are on the quality of the milk and therefore the quality of the cheese that's being made from the milk. Um, I've had a long career as a cheese maker. I've been operating Parish Hill Creamery here in Vermont, my hometown, since 2013. And so I'll be bringing in some stories of the uh, kind of farm that we work with and the type of milk that we work with for our cheese, but let's move on into the presentation. All milk is not the same as viewed by a cheesemaker. We're not thinking of milk as fluid milk. We're thinking of the kind of milk that we specifically need to make the cheese we intend to make. So I know in Australia, you're not able to make raw milk cheese. So I'm not going to be talking about that specifically in this presentation. Um, you're going, you have to pasteurize your milk for making cheese there. However, I do think that there is, if we look at this, the third and fourth bullet points, there is definitely a uh, criteria around choosing milk for making specific varieties of cheese. And uh, that may involve the composition of the milk or, or the feed program uh, on the farm where the milk is made. And at the bottom, Essentially, what is happening with a raw milk cheese system with very natural methods of making cheese, including the production of your own starter cultures. We can think of the pod of cheesemakers in Somerset in England that uh, have a slow food presidio around their raw milk cheddar, uh, where they've been using autochthonous, which are the natural starters for a long time, decades there to make their cheese. And uh, they just came out of a phase of pasteurizing milk for their cheese making, and they're back into making raw milk cheese again. So I do think that we can think of taste of place in context with having to pasteurize our milk, although the microbiology has changed extensively. So we're not really working with microbes so much from our place anymore. We're having to add in bacteria, yeast, and molds to construct our cheese. We all have to start with high quality raw milk, no matter what the next part of the process is. Um, and here we're going to be, I'm going to be looking at some different variables, going back to the original title, uh, how the milk's produced, how it's stored, and maybe how long it's stored, and then, Finally, we'll look at transportation as a effect as well. Um, heat treating milk by pasteurization and thermization, which is a, a, a temperature and time regimen that's below pasteurization, uh, will change the milk physically and bio biologically. Um, and that really is a topic for another presentation uh, where I could go on for an hour just about what the pasteurizing process does to milk prior to it being used for cheese. However, we can think about it as a, in context of, of comparing it to raw milk cheese, we can think about it that we're provided with a blank canvas to then apply cultures to, to create the texture and flavor of our cheese. And historically and in, in the rules of production that govern some uh, cheeses, uh, say for example, uh, Gruyere, the brand, the Conte, or uh, something like a Parmigiano Reggiano, um, they can only be made with raw milk. And the idea that we can reconstruct that uh, by using the blank canvas of the pasteurized milk is is a bit out there for me. I just think we have to acknowledge that those cheeses are, are uh, the flavors come from the, the raw milk itself and then the natural processes of making the cheese. So what we're gonna do when we use pasteurized milk is, 
is uh, then focus in more on what is the farm doing that our milk is coming from? How long do we store the milk? And uh, how do we transport it from the farm to where we make cheese? And that could be uh, down the road here in the presentation. So I've broken it down into six different areas where uh, we can call these effects. Specific needs by the cheesemaker may be related to breeds, environment, feed, seasonality, microbiology, and then the components of the milk itself, specifically the ratio of protein to fat. So I think that breeds are suited to the environment. Like historically, the kind of animals that are milked and then provide the milk to the cheesemaker, they are originating from different places and different regions of the world. And at this point in time, we still have some of those in place, although we have domination by, you know, say the Holstein cow in the in cows, and then with goats, we may be seeing more of of just a few breeds versus a wide variety of breeds, particularly in the U.S. Here, just as examples. Um, but I I will give you a couple stories here around uh, what cheesemakers have chosen to do on the breed side here in the U.S. at Meadow Creek Dairy in Virginia, they've been actively milking cows, breeding cows for 25 years and making cheese for 20. And they're at about, let's see, what, about 1,000 meters elevation, 800 meters elevation in the Appalachian Mountains. And up there, it's, uh, the land is very marginal and any open land that's in the Appalachians around that Southern Virginia, is uh, devoted to pasturing. So you have a lot of beef animals up there, but very few dairies left. But this one in particular makes cheese. And over the years, they've developed a breed that is really adapted well to the, the pastures they have up there and can make great milk for cheese on those pastures. Um, very high protein and moderate fat, which is very good for, for cheese making milk. You can make a wide variety of cheeses that way. We'll get into that later. But their, their uh, crossbreed started with Jersey and then Montbéard and then Frisian. So uh, the dark, you know, the big black Frisian cows, the sort of modeled Montbéards, and then the Jersey, which we all know very well, have been crossbred successfully over the years. And we can compare that to, say, Uplands cheese uh, up in uh, Wisconsin, which is Western Wisconsin, again, very marginal land, only really suited for pasturing. And that farmer, uh, chose, uh, that cheesemaker chose to work with a farm that had Jersey cows that were already uh, in place and they just had to uh, figure out how to get the right kind of milk to make a Gruyere style cheese, which is the Pleasant Ridge Reserve. But, you know, they're still, with the uh, purebred jerseys. So I think essentially in many cases, um, what the milk is depends on what the farmer's choice is. And that's just uh, natural that a farmer would, would choose you know, the breed based on what they like to work with. So we're gonna take the next four points one at a time, feed, seasonality, microbiology, and components. And I'm going to jump right into um, looking at feeds. And then we're going to bring Nick in very shortly. So for all cheeses, uh, I would say the top three bullet points are going to be apt because we're not talking about fermented feeds here. So. Uh, first of all, we have a year-round type, type of farm management system, which uh, would be with pasture in the summer and then sufficient dry hay in the winter. So this is a non-fermented feed type of management system at a farm. 
taking advantage of pastures and then making sure enough hay is put up. And again, I'm talking from my perspective being in Vermont. And uh, actually that middle picture uh, of the dry hay in the hay dryers from Quebec, and we have a very similar kind of dairying management style in Vermont as they do in Quebec. Although I must say I was interested to see these hay dryers, which are were Swiss or Austrian uh, design manufactured that are being used up in Quebec and they can cut hay and then they, they pick it up loose and they're able to drop it in these big barns with hot air coming up through these racks to dry hay in uh, stages. So you can put in about a foot deep of hay, dry it, add in the next cutting, dry it and on and on. Whereas as a kid here in Vermont, I was completely used to uh, hay bales, square hay bales as the dry hay. And then came the big round bales. So uh, the second system would be seasonal, grass-based uh, with pasture and dry hay to supplement, just meaning that we're not milking all year round. It's a kind of management style where, where we're having most of our calves in, in the, for on the cow side in the spring. Um, some people would go reverse season here, but that's very rare. And then of course, sheep dairying, uh, as I know it, mostly in, in this uh, country is done on pasture. So that's very seasonal. And goats to a large extent uh, for cheesemakers in the US are still seasonal producers. They will begin having their kids in February, January, February, and then milk starting to get milk in February, March and ending up around this time of year into heading to New Year's for a, just a short break of a couple months versus with sheep, it's more like a six month break. And then the third option uh, is really the way I started out as, as a, with my cheese milk on my family's farm. We were, uh, I, I would just call this the wisdom of the day. We were told uh, by veteran cheesemakers that we consulted right around here in Southern Vermont that the best way to make a consistent quality cheese was to provide a consistent quality diet. So we actually didn't graze the cows. We, they had a cow yard to mill around in, but we brought dry hay to them year round every day, fed them dry hay. And it's interesting to compare that with the top two, which later in my career, um, or actually not long after being in the family business, I went to Shelburne Farms to make cheddar for three years. And there we were up at the top one where they were really utilizing the pasture land to the, to the hilt, you know, as much as possible. And then on and on through the years of my career, I've just seen so many different approaches, including a lot now on this bottom uh, area of when we're talking about fermented feeds and maybe cheeses that we choose. That's why I highlighted this uh, higher acidity salt and age less, uh, age at less than 50 degrees for, for like cheddar cheese would be a good example that could work from for a fermented feed like those wrap bales, blue cheese, feta cheese, they all have those characteristics of their chemistry that help prevent this gas from forming. Whereas a cheese like a Gouda, or it's like a Emmentaler, not such great choices here. Although there are cultures now that can be added to the milk to hold back the, the uh, butyric type bacteria, the propionic type bacteria that you don't want that may come from a fermented feed. The, uh, the aging time here could be an important factor in the cheese you choose to make. So if you're not aging your cheese, very long, like past 60 days, you're gonna be running a lot less of a risk by using fermented feeds. If you're making soft cheeses uh, and cheeses like Brie, Camembert that are more on the acid side, you're gonna be at a less of a risk to poor quality cheese turning out. Um, I One of my favorite cheeses is, uh, is the Munster from France. And I was watching a film the other day made by the Mons uh, Affineurs about the uh, Munster from the Vos, the area in the uh, northern 
France near Germany. And in the film, they state clearly that they feed a diet with some uh, silage, some corn silage and pasture and together. So they're feeding out the corn silage and they're talking about how it creates this boozy, sweeter flavor in the cheese. So I think that it can be an effective kind of feeding program. Uh, and here I'll let Nick jump in. Okay, we welcome Nick Haddo with us. Sorry. Nick? Yeah, good day, Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Look, at short, at short notice today, we've, um, we've got Nick Haddo joining us. And now Nick had an interesting experience with silage last summer. Now, I know, Nick, you could present a webinar or two on this topic alone, but could you just give us a brief outline of what happened to you last summer? Uh, sure, sure. And hello, Peter. Nice to hello. hear you. Yeah, hey, Nick. Good to hear your voice again, too. <laughs> yeah, you too. Yeah, look, uh, just very, very briefly, because <clears throat> I wouldn't mind adding a, a couple of comments as well to particularly what we were just talking about in terms of silage. But we, uh, we have a small certified organic dairy farm running three different rare breeds in the Huon Valley at a place called Glen Huon. Now, um, around the kind of the, the middle of January, um, earlier this year, we, uh, you know, we, we were affected by bushfires down south. And the preparation plan that we had for that in order to um, rescue our, our herd, you know, our, our greatest asset, as well as our dairy and our sheds, was to relocate our mobile uh, irrigator, which has about a sort of a 50 metre radius, so about a sort of a 100 metre um, spread of water, uh, relocate it off our pasture, um, bring it up to the, around the dairy, and if it got really hairy, we would move our cattle up into our holding yards at our dairy, uh, turn on our irrigator, and so that we didn't have to worry about our cows and, and, and our fire. Now we actually had to implement that plan three times over a three week period. Um, and all up, we had our irrigator off our pasture at a critical growing phase, sort of mid January um, to mid uh, February. Now that's the equivalent for you, Peter, would be sort of late, late spring kind of start of summer. So, you know, a critical growing phase in, in the pasture base. Uh, as a result, that pasture didn't receive any irrigation or any rainfall for sort of 35 days that it was off and it, it essentially, it, it just died. Um, and which is a shame because not only is that our pasture base for our, you know, feeding our cattle because we're a grass-based dairy, but also we weren't able to lock away any paddocks to cut hay or, or silage. As a result, in the middle of summer, we were feeding out silage that we had made in, in November and early December. Um, and the consequence of that was this year's summer cheese. We make a raw milk hard cooked curd cheese. Uh, had characteristics of winter cheese, even though it was made in the middle of summer. So that, you know, that was very interesting, but it's sort of long term effects, even though um, bushfire didn't actually enter our property, it stopped at our neighbour's property, so we didn't have any fire damage. We certainly had some enormous long-term effects from preparing to fight the bushfire that we are still feeling and all up it's, you know, it's probably cost the business somewhere between forty-five and fifty thousand dollars in order to be able to kind of recover from that. We sort of had to buy feed, milk production was reduced. Um, as well as the direct costs in, in preparation and, and fighting the fire itself. So, Nick, that's probably going to be a much bigger issue in times to come because it has affected people in New South Wales as well. But thanks for your participation yeah. today and I hope we can coerce yeah, you at some no point problem. to present another webinar. Okay, then. Bye. Jenny, can I, can I make, Jenny, can I make yes. one very quick point? Yes. Just it, it might help guide the conversation a little bit later on in that um, the Food Standards Australia and New Zealand have actually uh, banned the use of silage
for any cheeses to be made out of unpasteurized milk in Australia. Um, and that's certainly a, a fight that we'll be taking to them um, early next year because I'd, I do believe passionately in, in the use of well-made and well-managed fermented feeds for cattle. I do understand that you know, there are some risks, particularly around you know, Clostridium turbotricum um, and uh, you know, we're, we're learning them all the time. But I think that to rule out the use of silage for cheese making is, is uh, maybe not telling the whole truth. Okay, so thanks. Last week we had Matteo Kiela from Jasmine Hill, mm -hmm. and he was speaking about his silage and his process of silage. And so if anyone wants that recording, they're welcome to it. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. Right, Pete, we're back no into you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, good luck. That, that sounds rough. We don't have to deal with fires in Vermont uh, much, <laughs> and they're usually in the forest if they are at all. Okay, anyways, uh, this would be the concern with uh, using silage is the spores that can be in the milk. And we can see through this chain of events, starting with contaminated soil uh, and, uh, well, not so much soil, but the, the, uh, um, the fact that the, the bacteria, well, you could get to a point where it's a, it's like a carousel that, that the manure is back on the land, recontaminating the land, as you see the manure, the fourth box down. But, um, but it really starts out with, with the uh, silage being of low quality. And so there we get our growth and sporulation of bacteria that come from the soil, which is called the basal source of contamination here. But you have to have quite a few of these uh, spore forming bacteria, Clostridia tyropetericum, to uh, then infect the milk enough to produce very gassy cheese to the point where it's just not a good cheese. Um, you have to have greater than 500 spores per liter just to introduce risk. And then, you know, well over a thousand to, to know that, that you're going to get a bad result. So, it really comes down to forage testing and the presence of butyric acid in the forage itself would be a real uh, flag of, of not to feed that to milking animals. So good management, I'm with Nick, good management of fermented feed uh, can be a way to utilize it for cheese making. Um, there, as I, in the previous slide, there are cheeses that are more at risk, less at risk. So when we take a look at um, this next slide, what I call the feed pyramid that I made up myself, uh, just thinking about uh, how feed affects the kind of cheese I would want to make. I, I'm using Conte as an example. So that's the very famous French Gruyere that's uh, made, uh, you know, in uh, a large consortium type. Uh, um, organization where you have farmers who are members, cheesemakers who are members. That many of the cheeses go on their age by uh, affineurs, people whose own whose profession is to age cheese, and it's a it's a unified brand, the Conte. And so here we do know from having studied that that they have different grades of quality, and we also know that they have as a rule of production that they won't allow any kind of fermented feeds. And this is because it's just too risky. Um, these are natural type processes of making this cheese. So they're not allowed to use selected starters, you know, including uh, a sort of a hold back culture approach where I'm gonna put in this starter that's not from the milk at all. And that's gonna help overcome the problem with the growth of these spores. And, uh, and then the other bacteria I would point out that, that uh, when you have uh, too many of them, you can also get at this from forage analysis with propionic acid in the forage would be your propiony bacterium, which are responsible for the uh, eye development in cheeses like Emmentaler and to some extent Conte can have a little bit. So 
these are naturally occurring bacteria, particularly in clover type uh, plants. And so you can get those in the raw milk, but they're generally speaking aren't enough in a natural system to uh, present a problem to the cheesemaker. It's only when you have the silage, you know, and you're feeding that out in the barn and it starts to characterize the environment of the barn that you are going to spread those bugs around, whether they be Clostridia type butyric acid producers or Propioni bacterium type propionic acid producers. They all produce a lot of carbon dioxide um, given the chance. And where do they get their chance? When it's warm enough, when the cheeses are low enough in salt, and when the cheeses don't have as much acidity, which bingo is Conte cheese. So you can see why in the pyramid, the, there's no use of fermented feeds for that. However, on the right-hand side, um, uh, we can put down the same ones that I mentioned in the previous slide, and then introduce the younger, shorter age cheeses like Brie, and then fresh cheeses like lactic style, fromage or Clark, and then mozzarella. So um, as, as we look at the top of the pyramid, then we're seeing that the very finest cheese of the Conte brand is the Alpage. So that's the cheese that's only made in the chalets and the old fashioned methods. Uh, and those pastures, those Alps are untouched except for by cows. Um, in other words, they're not seeded, they're not tilled, nothing's going on except the annual process of grazing. Um, this also makes me think about uh, a company that I, I really like that's in a Basque company um, called Aguar, A-G-U-O-R, and they are specialists in the Pyrenees style sheep milk, Toms that the Basque make, you know, that's their heritage cheese, everyone eats it, it's fantastic cheese. And they um, are large enough to where they're collecting milk from many dairies around them. Uh, it's actually quite a good prospect if you're a young person to have a sheep dairy. The government is really behind the, uh, that kind of um, farming and then the cheese making from it. So uh, what they do is they thermize the milk and this is pretty, common like approach to in Europe to where they don't pasteurize but they they thermize meaning that they're they're cooking the milk at a little bit below pasteurization and this makes sure so that there's more there's a survival of, of more bacteria than would be in a pasteurization process and many of these bacteria like these lactobacilli which are heat resistant um, and some can even survive pasteurization. Some of the propionic, propioni bacterium survive pasteurization, some of the strains, but at thermization, you're gonna capture more of those. So then you're gonna be producing a cheese that's a little more uh, complex than a pasteurized milk cheese. You don't have to rely as much on the cultures that you're adding. Um, and so that's just a little aside, but, but their uh, finest cheese in their brand is actually made by a family in a chalet type situation on one mountain in uh, in the Basque in the Pyrenees, and so again we can see how, you know, this management system, the way the milk is produced, gives uh, the different qualities to the cheeses. I think uh, the environment and feed are related because. You're, that's where these bacteria, yeasts, and molds are being captured from the environment where the feed is. So whether the animals are on a pasture or whether they're in the barn with the feed being laid out in front of them, you're gonna get a characteristic uh, microbiology from that area where the feeding is done. Um, so these are just some of the things that I've noticed uh, through my career in cheese. So uh, sometimes we can get earlier development of carbon dioxide in cheese. And this could be, I've seen this frequently in our own cheese making here at Parish Hill because we work with the farm that grazes the cows for six months from May until the end of October typically. And we will see, depending on the kind of year it is, more or less open texture in our cheeses. They're all made from raw milk. So without pasteurizing or thermizing, we're not gonna eliminate 
leuconostoc type bacteria, which uh, are mesophiles. So they, they only can survive up to 105. And so these bacteria will then be growing during the cheese making process. And uh, they are gonna contribute to the texture and even the flavor of the cheeses, which uh, is something to consider. Um, then uh, another type of early gas development could come from more of a contamination of the milk with uh, bacteria that shouldn't be there and, and yeast as well. So the, all these, uh, these uh, bacteria and, or these microbes I'm talking about now wouldn't survive pasteurization. So uh, if the milk has not uh, been put at risk before pasteurization, uh, from a quality standpoint, then pasteurization would eliminate these kinds of defects in cheese. However, for a raw milk cheese maker, uh, they could be disastrous. And then the the next kind of set of um, of this gas development is from late gas development. So after three weeks, and I was saying in the earlier slide, past 60 days, yeah, it usually takes more like two months for me to see it, uh, but it can occur after three weeks. So it really depends on the type of bacteria that, and or, well, not so much the type, but the uh, temperature that the cheese is being aged at. So if it's being exposed to a warmer temperature, you may see it earlier than if the cheese is aging at a colder temperature. And when these bacteria, both the, the butyric types and the propiani types grow in cheese during aging, they will create gas that's very uh, uneven, you know, when it's, when it's out, of, out of control. It's not just nice bubbles of carbon dioxide, it's, it's craters, it's cracks and, and such. And then the flavors that come with that are usually not good. Although with the propiani bacterium type fermentation going on, it's really just, uh, it could be like a tongue cheese you're making that, that's a little bit on the Swissy side, for example. I've had that happen to me when I do classes here and we're using the milk from the farm in the winter time when they do feed some fermented hay, those wrap bales. So it could be very mild like that where the cheese would still be delicious or it could be more disastrous where your cheese is just horrible. We look at the, um, the Microbiology, I really think it's shaped by the means of production, which can even get at how you're going to milk the animals, you know, mobile parlor, parlor all, all the way down to the robot. And uh, I just believe because of the way it's all set up to milk the animals, you're going to influence the microbiology of the milk. We can look down at the effects of storage temperature and time as well. And uh, again, this is from my experience. I really believe the fresher, the better. I, as I was um, learning the craft of cheese making, I had uh, different teachers. I had one from France, a couple from France, three from France, <laughs> maybe more. And uh, I had a, a great teacher from England and then I had uh, some classes with an Italian uh, professor, a couple of different ones there, and they all kind of stuck to this uh, less than 40 hours. So don't make, try to not have to make cheese from milk that's stored more than 40 hours or four milkings uh, in the tank. And actually starting the summer before last at Parish Hill Creamery here, the, our family business, we, because we make cheese with natural methods, we really wanted to try to capture the taste of place as best we could. And we realized that the last piece in the puzzle beyond the local salt, the, the natural cultures that we make ourselves and the animal rennet was, and the raw milk was the storage time on the milk. And so we just thought, you know, that it would be a lot more true to the, the native microbiology of this milk if we used the milk every day. In other words, the longest that we would store milk is, would be from the previous afternoon evening. So that gives us about up to, at the most, a 16 hour storage time before we're collecting the milk and using it for cheese. And I do think I've noticed 
a significant difference in uh, the way these cheeses taste. I'm certainly getting less gas development in the cheese using the fresher milk. So that's, that's really interesting from the standpoint of delivering the taste of place. Uh, and some cheeses, their rules of production won't allow the milk to be stored below uh, 10 degrees centigrade, 50 Fahrenheit. And this is to, again, make sure that the native microbiology of the milk is preserved. When I was in my family's business and we were learning uh, the craft of making brie and camembert from uh, a French company that we were partners with for about a year, we were having to pasteurize the milk to make these cheeses because they age less than 60 days. However, they, they taught us a technique called pre-ripening. And I've learned this from other French uh, teachers and cheesemakers as well, where they'll hold the milk at 50 degrees overnight, the raw milk that we're going to use for cheese the next day. And essentially, uh, this milk is then dosed with a mesophilic culture at a very low rate, about a tenth of what you would use during cheese making. And this is known as uh, creating the milk of the past. So you're, you're putting in a low dose of bacteria, and this is to help protect the milk against the growth of, of, say, bacteria that are adapted to the cold more and don't have much use in cheese making for texture and flavor development. Even though we pasteurized the milk the next morning, um, the theory here is that the bacteria, when they die off, are releasing lots of enzymes. And of course, it's enzymes that create the uh, flavor in cheese as they break down the fats and protein. So that was just kind of very interesting that uh, happened to me early in my career. And I've, uh, I've noticed that for cheeses like the Conte, they don't store the milk below 10 centigrade. We were, just came back from Bra in Italy where I got to go to a couple different uh, seminars and the Italian professors in the, on the panel were talking about not storing the, fre this again is fresh milk just from the evening production. Uh, below 15, 16 centigrade, which is more like, you know, 58 degrees. So uh, I just think that's very interesting, you know. But the bottom line is that we are, are trying to preserve the original microbiology of the milk, and we have to have exceptionally high quality milk to be able to do this. Because if we subject the milk to these higher temperatures and we have introduced other bugs through the uh, equipment that we're using to produce the milk and store it, we may not get as great of a result. And one of the culprits would be these psychotrophic group bacteria that uh, are very proteolytic. So we can get defects in our cheese like, uh, like you know, as they begin to proteolize rapidly, the texture gets sticky, pasty, and a bitterness can develop. The other thing is, uh, I'm going to move on to seasonal milk production next. And we're talking about late lactation milk, where you know you, you have this elevated level of, of a natural milk enzyme in the it's called plasmin, so protease, it breaks down the casein. And the longer we store the milk here, or maybe storing it at a higher temperature uh, with older milk beyond the just the evening, uh, could could really lead to considerable losses and the inability to make a good aged cheese because we're with those canes that have been uh, broken down more we're going to trap more water in the cheese not to mention that generally speaking in late lactation milk we have an elevated fat content which makes it harder to work water out of the cheese um also think about the cooling rate you know how how uh quickly the milk gets cooled down and then the agitation of the milk during cooling of uh, transportation as well. That the more we are, are gonna bash that milk around, the more we're gonna activate the uh, lipase is gonna be able to get directly at fats and begin to break them apart into fatty acids. And we may end up with higher levels of butyric acid forming, which wouldn't be such a good thing for our cheese. Anything beyond, beyond just picante, is, uh, is usually not appreciated by someone who's eating the cheese. And even some consumers don't like picante, I've noticed as well. So we have that as a concern. If we're not making hard Italian cheeses, we don't want that 
kind of flavor in our cheese. So again, just to finish this thought off, uh, if we're gonna store milk at an elevated temperature and try to do the pre-ripening, uh, whether or not we pasteurize the next day, we have to have very high quality milk. And here's a, a good chart to um, demonstrate these big, four big groups of, of bacteria that are in raw milk. So we have our psychotropes that are adapted to the cold. They grow well below five centigrade. They're the ones that produce stronger enzymes, proteases that can degrade the protein and subsequently cause issues in our cheese quality, if not just loss of yield. The, the cultures that are, are made for us to use are comprised uh, of bacteria that are from the mesophilic and thermophilic groups and those are our seven different type of bacteria that our starter cultures are made out of but then all of our, many of our ripening cultures uh, are mesophilic like our yeast and molds and micrococci type bacteria for washed rind cheeses brevi bacterium linens for washed rind cheeses but then we have our thermophiles there's there are plenty of lactobacilli that have been selected by culture houses to develop cultures from their strains of them that can produce sweet, savory flavors in the cheese, classic kind of like Alpine style flavor, or here in the U.S., the new cheddar, you know, that's called, known as the Helveticus cheddar, because you put in Lactobacillus Helveticus in a cheddar make, and it makes the cheese sweeter. So, and then on to the right, you can see, even though we're at pasteurization, 63 uh, Fahrenheit, and for, I mean, 63 centigrade, 145 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, we, some bacteria are gonna survive. They're not pathogens, but they, again, could be Propiani bacterium strains. They could be the spore formers that we don't want. They could be also lactobacilli that are gonna characterize some of the flavor of our cheese. So here are just some of the things I've noticed by, uh, by uh, milk that's, um, that's not up to snuff. So we can get, uh, again, the coliform type contamination where we have the, the unclean flavor, a lot of CO2. Uh, thermoduric bacteria, those lactobacilli, uh, we get, can get little gas bubbles forming and cheeses like cheddar and then the sweeter flavor that we don't really want. Um, that's usually attributed to cleaning of equipment not being done up to snuff, that we'll get those in a cheese like a cheddar. And finally, when we have high somatic cell count, we can get uh, uh, difficulty to, uh, to produce acid in the cheese make, but then with other contaminating type bacteria, uh, we can get off flavors developing. Like enterococci type, would be one group that I could point at, although not all of them, but some of the species would be producing uh, off flavors. So we we look at seasonality in uh, in the production of milk and how it affects uh, cheese making. And right here we have a, a page that this is out of my master's work, and I was able to match every week the milk composition from a herd of brown Swiss cows at Shelburne Farms that went from this point zero was early June all the way to Christmas and uh, over that time I measured the milk composition every week the protein and fat you can see here and how it changes and then on the right hand side we have our moisture content of the cheddar cheese that we're, we're making there and um, the target was between 35 and 36 percent moisture and you can see how in the late lactation period when the difference between the fat and protein is greater and we have a lower ratio of protein to fat, it was much harder to control moisture. So that's, that's an effect that, uh, that we can notice when we're making cheese. And to sum it up for late lactation milk, we have uh, these issues here, uh, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, but also uh, when you're on pasture and you're still on pasture, and you're making your milk that way and you're late in lactation, you can get 
things are like the, the feed is not as of high quality, we can get a mineral imbalance in the milk. Um, often the pH has gotten quite high and it makes it harder for the things to go during cheese making as I list down here. And ultimately what we're leading up to is cheese that is high in moisture for the kind we're trying to make. And so this is where the idea of, you know, these shorter age cheeses like the Tums came from. You make the smaller wheels in late lactation and or you make a lactic type cheese and then you avoid having the poor quality because you're not trying to make your large format long age cheeses at that time. So the other thing you can do is uh, alt in cow milk, you can alter the ratio of protein to fat. So we can skim some cream out to, uh, to raise that ratio so that then we can make a harder cheese. Rather than the, the cheese becoming softer, um, we can control the body of the cheese by altering the ratio of protein to fat by skimming some cream out of the milk. But I just gave you an example of how a cheesemaker would go and make a tom cheese in the fall, heading into early winter after they've been making a, a big hard cheese like a Gruyere on the Alp. And that's a classic thing that cheesemakers do, uh, have been doing for generations to work with the milk in the best way possible. This is just a, a chart I did one year uh, when I was uh, making cheese, uh, not for my own company, but at a, at a different place where I was, I was working with the milk from three different farms. And my target was to be around 0 0.80 uh, all through the year if I could. And it was just interesting, you, you know, to look at this, how I was successful in, in the one farm, JG, which, uh, which we were, it was too far away really, so we couldn't work with that farm anymore. And we were switching to the L farm and that farm took over. And then these, and that stayed right around where my target, where I wanted for that whole year. And then the two new farms, one of them was milking uh, brown Swiss cows, and that's the Bro farm. And then the other farm, the Brooks farm, was milking jerseys that they had gotten from a single farm. And that farm had been breeding for very high fat. So you can see how the ratio of protein to fat was quite low there. We actually couldn't make our hard cheese from that milk. We either had to blend uh, that milk with, with the other, like the L, or make a set make just use that for our soft wash dry cheese so as a cheese maker i was working with the milk once again that's the idea and here i just put up a, i'm glad you're getting this as a um this presentation because you can utilize this little chart i made to help me may, maybe guide you around decisions uh, of making cheese from cow's milk where you can actually separate cream to change the ratio of protein to fat but I know we don't have much time left and I'm gonna move right on to the next one, which is a summary of just uh, the, the uh, other milks that aren't from cow. Um, so you do not have to standardize uh, goat, sheep, and, and buffalo milk for cheese making because the fat globules are so small that through the process of making the cheese, you get at the texture. You can make your cheese more granular, by you know having a recipe like a Romano, you can make your uh, your cheese uh, um, fit the um, fit the style. I mean, you can make your milk fit the style of cheese you want just by your uh, knowledge about how to work with the milk. Um, those small fat globules, and then in the case of sheep milk that has a very high casein content compared to uh, cow or goat milk and calcium that helps those cheeses to, to make harder cheeses out of them, which is pretty much traditional. And then we have on the goat side, the a little bit difference in the caseins help that cheese uh, drive it more towards a, a hard Sardinian style cheese, which in that part of Italy, those are really popular. I mean, that's kind of what they make there. Uh, finally, we're gonna look at uh, transportation um, of the milk. And here I'm going to say uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the bottom uh, 
sentence is the most important. Uh, if whatever you can do to keep equipment and time to a minimum during transportation is going to help preserve the original microbiology, prevent contaminants from getting into the milk. Nothing really good comes from equipment. So we want to make sure that we can minimize the disruptive microbes uh, that are going to be added to the milk by our equipment, such as pumps, hoses, and tanks. And we want to try to keep the hauling time down. Um, there, there are people in my neck of the woods that, that really like to use cans because uh, the milk doesn't slosh around so much. But they're, they're going you know, less than an hour uh, for transportation there. We have quality standards in the U.S., uh, and I don't believe that these are really uh, going to uh, help to pr produce a high-quality milk for making cheese. We have to add in new ideas on, on how, uh, what kind of tests we want uh, on the milk. And so I just mentioned a few at the bottom. The coliform group would be nice to know how many of those there are, Staphylococcus aureus, and then the thermoduric count. Uh, this can all be done by the laboratory to give you a better uh, raw milk cheese profile. So instead of just milk that's destined for fluid. And we can cr construct a little chart here. Again, that'll be good for you guys to have as a resource to help uh, source the, um, the uh, defect that, that uh, I mean, the, uh, the quality issue, excuse me. And it's time for questions. Well, thank you so much. That your knowledge um, is just so extensive and amazing. And I know you could speak for hours on this, Peter. Yeah, I wish I had two for this one. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's really outstanding. Unfortunately, our um, niche artisan cheese makers haven't been able to make it today. They've sent messages saying that um, they're busy cheese making, which is the way it goes. So um, the other members who are listening, if you have any questions, if you'd like to type them in, that would be good.